two weeks after Jacko's return to the training and combat unit at Cranfield, Air Station Commander Pep Wheeler called me into his office and informed me that I had been awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross for my actions against enemy reconnaissance aircraft flying at low altitude and Jacko had been awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross. I sent a congratulatory telegram to Jacko and together with Squadron Leader Wing Commander Cleland, Styx and a few other friends motored to Maidstone to celebrate the occasion during a lepsh at the Star Hotel. I'm afraid we didn't show ourselves to our best advantage in that establishment. The barmaid wanted to close the bar at two o'clock in the afternoon as usual, but we had other plans. We removed her from behind the bar and escorted her outside. The agitated hotel management began urging us to leave the bar. After a brief argument, we agreed and happily loaded into our cars, all quite worn out. I insisted on driving my own car and, to the consternation of a vigilant policeman, immediately hit a small flower bed in the middle of the main street. The damage seemed to be minor, so I backed up and continued on my merry train to West Morling, waving to the policeman. A few weeks later I received a summons for dangerous driving and damaging town of Maidstone property, namely a flowered. This cost me five pounds, which was not much for such a lavish celebration. In the last quarter of 1942, in addition to sporadic night raids, the enemy began to use small groups of bombers and fighter bombers or single planes that made daytime raids when the weather over England was too bad for our spitfires. There were many days when the weather conditions over our east and south coasts were unfavorable, but good over Luftwaffe airfields in occupied Europe. Approaching England, the enemy used clouds for cover, then dropped bombs blindly or dive-bombed through the clouds to conduct targeted bombing and low-altitude assaults. It was nearly impossible for day fighters without airborne radars to intercept these planes. Our GCI and shell radars could only bring them within about 1.5 kilometers of the enemy, and to counter this threat, the Royal Air Force began using night fighters during the day. Having onboard radars, they could pursue targets in and out of clouds and at least had a chance of attacking them. In addition, the Blue Fighters, with their range far exceeding that of the Spitfires, could take off in bad weather, and if unable to return to their own airfield, could be sent to almost any airfield in England where the weather was acceptable. The new use meant long hours of duty for us, but the Night Fighters welcomed any opportunity to intercept the Germans. The only German aircraft I had seen close during the day up to that time was a Junkers 88 moving away from a convoy near the East Coast in 1940. Our Blenheim could not get close enough to open fire. I looked forward to another chance. Sticks and I didn't wait long. On October 19, we were chatting in the crew's lounge. The weather was miserable. The ceiling was about 60 meters and visibility only 1.5 km. At 10.15, the order came to put one Bu fighter in the air. A few minutes later, we took off, and I had to navigate almost immediately by instruments only, as we entered the clouds barely off the ground. Styx checked his radar and I contacted the Big Teen Hill Sector Control Center. We had only leveled off at 900 meters, on the line of the upper edge of the clouds. The sector operator instructed us to patrol over the coastline. Above the clouds were blue skies, bright sunshine and unlimited visibility. After 15 or so minutes, the operator told us to contact the shell radar at Vanessa. That sounded like the case. I called him up and recognized the voice of Dave Mawood, one of the Royal Air Force's top guidance operators. Bob, I've got a bandit for you at 900 meters, heading 10 degrees, range 8 kilometers. I quickly deployed the BUEU and began to close in on him. Even before Styx made radar contact, I saw the plane gliding over the cloud top 6 to 8 kilometers ahead. I relayed to Dave Tally Ho, and as I shortened my distance, I realized it was a Dornier 217. By this time, Styx had gotten radar contact. When we were about three kilometers away, the Germans must have spotted us. They descended into the clouds. Damn it, Styx. It's up to you now. Okay, Bob. He's two and a half kilometers away. Turn left and we're down to 150 meters. Styx got me into position about 214 behind and 13 below, but the cloud cover was so thick I couldn't see anything. I hoped that the Dorier would think it had got rid of me and would rise again into clear skies, but it was a treacherous bird. The only thing I could do was to try to blindly shoot at it in the clouds. The chance of success was slim, but still better than nothing. After a few minor course changes, Stex spoke. It's time. I gently pulled the helm toward me and pressed the fire button for three seconds. 
The cannons rumbled, the BUU motored as we flew in the enemy airstream, but I saw nothing. No flashes, no explosions. Is he still there, Styx? Yeah, 210 meters ahead. Okay, let's try it again. This time we'll close to 180 meters. Let me know when he's exactly ahead and 30 meters up. We were still heading north, two planes playing hide and seek in dense cloud and only a few hundred meters apart. After 15 minutes of concentrating on precise instrument control, spots swam in my eyes. I shook my head and blinked to make them disappear. Okay, Bob, we're getting into position. He's about 180 meters away. He's about 30 meters about. I very slowly reduced my speed again to about 290 kai. The speed of Ardornia. I pressed the fire button and the Bufighter shuddered as four 20 cannons and six machine guns fired armor-piercing and incendiary shells and bullets. We hit the Germans' airstream again and I could see flashes ahead in the cloud. Styx. I think we hit him. Watch on radar what he's doing. He's coming down to the right. Very steeply to the right and losing altitude. Range 275 meters. We're descending, still in the clouds. Are you following him? After a second's pause, Styx replied. He's gone, Bob. I don't see anything on the radar screen. I told Styx I was going to go below the clouds and see if there was any debris. Okay, but for Christ's sake, pay attention. The clouds are almost down to the water. I knew we were somewhere over the sea north of the Thames estuary, so there was no fear of crashing into any hill. However, I was worried when we finally emerged from the clouds about sixty above the light grey surface of the water. It felt like we were almost above the waves. With visibility of about a kilometre, it was very difficult to look for the crash site and still fly the AGUs safely in circles at speeds reduced to 240 kumtre. After a few minutes it became clear that we were not going to be able to find anything. Medicine failure, Stikes. I don't think we can claim more than damage. It didn't get to its target, however. We climbed up into the clouds and soon came out into the sunlight. I called up Mawood and told him what had happened. He informed us only that after the battle the enemy plane had disappeared from his radar screen and nothing more. We could only assume that the enemy had turned for home at very low altitude, probably damaged, or had fallen into the sea. We never found out for sure. Our main concern now was to get home. Mawood found out about the weather at West Morling and informed us that it had deteriorated considerably since we had taken off. He directed us to Bradwell Bain on the north bank of the Thames estuary where the weather was a little better. There we landed without any problems by the time of the second breakfast. We were both disappointed, but at least the enemy had not reached his goal, and if he returned home, the story he told would not inspire the exploits of his comrades. They were no longer immune to our daylight attacks in difficult weather conditions. One morning, a week later, I was at the flight control station keeping in touch with the planes, and since nothing seemed to be happening, I gave Styx a free day. It was raining heavily, but the lower edge of the clouds were quite high, so I thought that only day fighters would be sufficient. I turned out to be wrong. Just after eleven o'clock we received an order to send out one Bu fighter for a standard patrol, because our intelligence had information about enemy activity in the air over northern France. At this point, the only available pilots were myself and the new radio sergeant, Haywood, who had only arrived in the squadron a week earlier and was not too familiar with our armed K-7 airborne radars. But we paired up and were soon at the disposal of squadron leader Gist, the senior GCI radar operator on the south coast. He reported that he had a bandit for us at 3,022 K, ahead approaching the coast near Eastbourne. I was familiar with airborne radar as I had acted as radio operator during training flights with other pilots in my wing, so was able to advise Haywood when in doubt. It was obvious that he was nervous, so I tried to encourage him. At 3,000 metres we were in and out of the clouds and descended below them at 60 metres where it was raining heavily, reducing the forward view from the Bue to 1.5 kilometres. When we were 5 kilometres from the target, Haywood pronounced contact and took pointing from the GCI operator. He quickly calmed down, and his messages regarding enemy position were intelligent and effective. I did not see the target until we were only 270 mm from it. Suddenly a Junkers 88 appeared at 1800 mm, executing a gentle right turn slightly above us. Okay, Haywood, I'll make it. At least I hoped I would. The rear gunners of the Junkers opened fierce fire, and the pilot desperately sought to escape into the clouds. 
I opened fire too soon, did not fire very accurately, and made no progress. However, it was not too difficult to follow my Luftwaffe buddy. I calmed down and fired two accurate bursts. Juice's 88 caught fire and spiralled steeply into the sea, raising a huge fountain of water on the surface and leaving a gradually blurring oil slick. I circled the crash site, which was about eight or so kilometres off the coast between Eastbourne and Hastings, but found no living Germans and headed home. Haywood had bled the enemy faster than he thought possible and was experiencing the elation of our success. He had done a fine job. After presenting the battle report to Flight Lieutenant Ham, our spy, Haywood and I spent the remainder of the day resting. He and his buddies celebrated their success, while I waited for the appearance of an angry Styx Gregory. When Styx arrived on duty the next morning and heard of our victory, he started swearing before I could take refuge in his office. My damn nimble pilot thinks he can execute this with every last radio operator, doesn't he? Deliberately sends me away for a day to show everyone that my presence isn't necessary. I've got news for you, sir. Squadron leader Bob Braham. From now on, you won't get rid of me so easily. By this time, the whole unit was rolling with laughter, and I had to endure Styx's friendly jokes for several more days. October 1942 was the month of pepper and salt in 29 Squadron, this relatively new duo proving themselves to be an outstanding night fighter crew. Since their arrival at the squadron in the summer, they have destroyed three German bombers. On the last night of October, they doubled their score by shooting down three more enemy aircraft during two sorties. At the time, this was a record for Allied night fighters. It was surpassed only once during the war, when our new squadron commander a few months later shot down four planes in one sortie, thus keeping the record for 29 Squadron. On that unforgettable night of October 31, the action began very early. As early as 9pm, most of my squadron was in the air. Soon Styx and I encountered a malfunction of our radar, hence we asked the shell operator at 4ES to bring up another of our aircraft from West Morling to replace us. At the same time, he informed us that he had a bandit for us, and we agreed to continue flying until our replacement arrived. The target was approaching the Thames estuary at 3000 dam, and the shell operator quickly put us into position behind it. But a malfunction in our radar prevented Styx from picking up the target until we were about 1.5 km away. Finally, when I had given up hope of intercepting her, we made radar contact. Styx's experience helped. The night was clear. I visually detected the aircraft at 900 meters and a little higher. As I got closer, I saw that it was a Dornier 217, a typical German twin-engine bomber with a twin tailplane, not much different from our Hempton. It seemed that the crew of the Dornier did not see us. From a distance of 135 meters, I fired two long bursts. The German immediately caught fire and crashed into the C-8 chem from North Foreland. We were filling in our combat report when Pepper and Salt landed. They had also shot down a Dornier 217 and the flight and ground personnel were cheering. Most of our blue fighters were back and it seemed that all the excitement was over when the operational communications phone rang again. The squadron commander rushed to it and then shouted to us that a new group of bombers was on its way and that we should rush as many planes as possible. Pepper and Salt, the squadron commander and two other crews immediately took off. We, on the other hand, had to wait for half an hour for technicians to repair our airborne radar. Finally, we took to the air, but it was too late. The raid on Canterbury had ended, and the bombers were gone. We returned home in time to pat Pepper and Sol on the back as they shot down two more Dorniers on their second sortie that night. A few weeks later, Pepper was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross, and Toon was awarded the Distinguished Flying Medal for this superbly executed job. A few more weeks later, the squadron suffered the shock of hearing that Pepper and Salt had crashed near the airfield. Flying the plane before night flights, they had fallen into a corkscrew from which they could not get out. It looked like poor old Paper had tried to perform a manoeuvre that the old buff fighter was incapable of. Usually the boo fighter would put up with a lot, but if the pilot got too hard it became an unforgiving airplane for mistakes. This tragedy was especially painful for us, because Pepper and his young wife were close friends of Joan and me. I didn't know how to tell her about it. She proved that she could be as resilient as her wonderful husband. The rest of the year passed with no success in the air for me, but in late November I was surprised to receive a letter from the Air Ministry informing me that I had been invited to an afternoon reception at Buckingham Palace. As a representative of Fighter Command, 
I was to help entertain a group of American officers on their Thanksgiving Day. I assumed the reception would be very formal, and I sincerely did not want to attend. When I arrived at the palace, I, along with the other officers, was introduced to the royal family. We exchanged handshakes with the king, the queen, the two princesses, Mr. Churchill, and other government and military officials. Finally, we were escorted to a large banquet hall where afternoon tea was served on many tables. I noted with interest that there were also bottles of wine on each table. The royal family joined us in a pleasant and informal reception. Everything was done to make us feel at home. In the course of this nice socializing, I made friends with an American army colonel, and later, after leaving the palace, in a very merry company, we went to his apartment, where we continued our merrymaking. That same night, I took the train back to West Morling, and perhaps a little drunkenly wondered why I had not at first wanted to take part in this delightfully friendly celebration. The royal family, like thousands of other families in England, had opened their doors and hearts to our allies and helped them feel at least a little bit at home. A week or so later, I visited the palace again. This time I was with Joan and Jacko. From the king's hands, Jacko and I received awards for our actions against German low-altitude spy planes. A few weeks before Christmas, I was summoned to 11th Air Group headquarters at Axbridge for a talk with the group commander. On the train, I tried to think through what the call meant. I was escorted to Air Vice Marshal Saunders, who after a few salutatory phrases told me that I had been promoted to the rank of acting wing commander and that I was to take charge of 141 Squadron at Ford on the south coast near Chichester. The group commander, despite his rank, kept very simple and told me straightforwardly about the problems. The 144th was not at its best. A new squadron commander, a link commander and an adjutant were to be appointed. The air vice marshal ordered me to get there as soon as possible and told me that the new wing commander and adjutant were on their way. A. Get the 141st back in combat uniform. If necessary, you will be given any assistance you require, he said. It was a real challenge. Leaving HQ to return to West Morling, I was already determined to make the 141st the best night fighter unit in the Royal Air Force. My appointment as squadron commander coincided with the period when the Allies were finally beginning to make gains on the ground. The famous 8th Army had won its final victory in the desert and was now well and on its way to link up with the Anglo-American armies in Tunisia. The Russians had destroyed the German 6th Army at Stalingrad, and even in the Far East, the clouds of defeat were beginning to slowly dissipate. Churchill called it a turning of the tide. Very different was the situation just six months earlier. Then the signs of hope were only in the air. On land and sea, the Axis forces seemed dominant. My thoughts were preoccupied with more personal issues. Since our marriage, I had been worried about my family living with me near the airfield. I felt it was bad for both my wife and me. After all, all sorts of things could have happened to me and I would have been more at peace if Joan had lived with her parents. As a squadron commander, I would have to spend a lot more of my free time on duty than I did when I was a squadron leader. But it was the only way to get to know the unit and to support and inspire it by personal example. I knew my wife would be saddened by the new separation. I didn't know how to inform her of my decision. Joan was delighted with my promotion and I think guessed my plans for her before I even told her about them. At least she made it clear that my opinion carried a lot of weight with her. I still had a lot of business to complete at 29 Squadron, so I was forced to fly back and forth between West Morling and Ford for almost two weeks. We decided that Joan would stay at our apartment in West Morling until New Year's Day and then return to her parents' house near Leicester. This implied that I would be able to see some of my family over Christmas. My parting from the 29th was sad. I had served in it since December 1938, nearly four years with only a break of six months when I was an instructor at Cranfield. I, the last of the 1938 model squadron, was leaving her. As it had been one of the most prolific night fighter squadrons, I was proud to have shared in its success. Now my loyalty was to find a new use. I was given the usual series of farewell parties, during which my mechanics presented me with a model of a Bufighter that I still have in my possession. It was made from the blade of one of the propellers of my with flight number 8,284, the airplane in which Jacko and I made an emergency landing at Freestone. The model was beautifully done and mounted on a fragment of the Hercules engine frame, mounted on a piston ring from the same engine. 
It was a touching gift on which its makers had spent many hours of painstaking work. It was a symbol that denoted for me a truth I knew well, the great bond between the flight and ground personnel in the 29th. They shared every success and every failure. This was a spirit I was sure to bring with me to the 141st. On taking command of 141 Squadron at the age of 22, I became the youngest officer with the rank of Wing Commander to lead a Royal Air Force Combat Unit, sharing that honour with Paddy Finucane. But it didn't mean much to me at the time. At Ford, after being introduced to Air Station Commander Pat Maxwell, a wee wee ace, I went to Squadron Headquarters where I was welcomed by my new adjutant, Flight Lieutenant Dickie Sparrow. I had a long conversation with him and soon had a general picture in my mind. The squadron was in crisis. Most of the senior aircrew members were married and living with their families away from the airfield, so they couldn't keep up with and manage things well enough. But most of them had received their transfer notices, and it was left to me to instill morale in the rest. Dickie, who had been a wool merchant in civilian life, immediately impressed me as the most suitable man for his job. He was older than all the airmen, a considerably more mature and tolerant man. His advice on administrative and personnel matters was invaluable. I dread to imagine what would have become of the paperwork without his unselfish guidance as I knew nothing about it. Dickey introduced me to the others. Quadri leaders Beale and Cooper commanded the links. Beale, a newly appointed one like myself. Buster Raindoles was spy, a sparrow-type man and just as useful. Dougal, the mad Irishman, was our duck. Despite his crazy antics, he proved indispensable in the months ahead. The airplane crews were a mixed group of New Zealanders, Australians, Belgians, Indians and other nations and a little diluted with Englishmen. One thing was certain. They were anxious to overcome the crisis and make a name for the squadron. Addressing them briefly, I told them what I expected them to do. It was simple. The 141st should be the best night fighter squadron in the Royal Air Force. I repeated the same speech, slightly modified, to the ground staff and felt proud that I had hit the mark, although I think anyone could have done it better than me. A few days later, the air group commander decided to inspect our air station and caught me by surprise. I didn't yet know all the crews by name and wasn't exactly sure where certain services were located in the air station. This visit led to several amusing incidents. Dickie quickly gathered our crews together, and I told them that if I couldn't remember anyone's last names, they would be Flag Officer Smith, Brown or Jones. If they objected to such temporary last names, they expressed no displeasure. I got most of the surnames right, but a few had to be called impromptu. Whether the Air Vice Marshal figured out this trickery of mine, I never... The inspectors were also led through our location. In order to avoid major blunders, I led Dickie everywhere, but even so I got caught. The Air Group Commander wanted to see our armory. I knew it was in one of the two barracks, but which one? Dickie, also a rookie, wasn't sure which one either. I said briskly for the Air Vice Marshal to follow me and opened the door gunnery shop, sir. A heavy silence hung. I showed the commander our washroom and restroom. Very interesting, Brem. Well, where's the gunnery workshop? He pronounced. It was supposed to be in another barracks, so I tried again, and this time I was right. Before I could say anything, the air group commander turned to the gunner, who, with his back to us, was inserting twenty emmy shells into the cannon belt. What are you doing, soldier? He asked. To which the gunner replied, What the hell does that remind you of? We were all stunned. And when the gunner turned around and saw who he was talking to, I thought he was about to faint. The air vice marshal, to his credit, reduced it to a joke, but we were glad when he left. Buster Reidles and Sparrow, soon after my arrival at Ford, asked me to take part in making a submission for the award of the Victoria Cross to one of the squadron's pilots, a Wraith officer who had been killed in action. His navigator survived. They intercepted a Heinkor 1 Lendi Weven over the English Channel, and during the battle the pilot was severely wounded. He continued to fire at the enemy until he shot him down, and only then turned for home. He knew his navigator could not swim, so he turned toward the coast and eventually crossed it. He then calmly ordered his navigator to parachute out. The navigator objected, saying he wanted to stay and help, but then realized there was no point in arguing. So he left the plane and landed safely by parachute. The brave pilot, who had remained calm the whole time despite being badly injured, crashed with his plane and died. The submission was sent, but then apparently rejected by the Air Defence Sector Commander. 
Buster and Dicky felt that the latter had no sympathy for 141 Squadron because of its lack of good flying qualities. I agreed with them that we should raise the matter again. We rewrote the submission and sent it with a cover letter asking them to reconsider. We failed again. Up to that point in the Second World War, only one fighter pilot had received the Victoria Cross. That was Flight Lieutenant Nee Colson, who was awarded it during the Battle of Britain. Not only would such an award be a fitting memorial to a hero, but it also boosted the morale of fighter command in general and night fighters in particular. After the New Year, Joan wrote to me that her parents were ready to receive her at their home in Leicester. I, along with Styx, flew out to West Morning in a Bufighter to help her with her departure. We spent two wonderful days together in our settled apartment in West Morling. Joan informed me that she was expecting her second child, who would probably be born in July. This was wonderful news that greatly softened the severity of our separation. We hoped it would be a daughter and tried to agree on a name for her. We agreed on Wendy. On the second evening of my visit to West Morling, the air raid sirens howled. I called 29 Squadron to let them know that Styx and I could help as we had a ready-to-fly boy fighter. Joan was angry. I must admit acted very selfishly. However, the commander of 29 Squadron refused our services. He had enough crews and airplanes to cope. At the time, I thought I was obliged to fly. My thoughts were with the squadron as I lay with my eyes open and listened to the boy fighters taking off from a nearby airfield. The next morning we learned that the Germans had made a small raid on Kent and the south coast in two waves, and that the commander of the 29th had shot down four planes. This was excellent news, but I wondered how my own squadron was doing at Ford. I'm afraid my thoughts dominated my feelings as I hurriedly put Joan and Michael on the train to Leicester. I thank God for an understanding wife. Our happy days together were over. From this time until the end of the war, I very seldom visited Leicester. I hurried to West Morling Airfield, where Styx was waiting for me. He had contacted 141 Squadron at Ford and informed me that during a night sortie Cook's Bufighter, one of my New Zealanders had been shot down, but the latter and his radio operator had survived by jumping out on parachutes. As soon as we returned, Buster Reindolz arranged for me to meet Cook, who seemed to be unhurt in any... From an analysis of the information he received, it appeared that my crew had been accidentally shot down by the commander of 29 Squadron, and that ours was one of the four planes whose destruction the latter had claimed. This error, given the heat of battle, was not difficult to understand. The Bufighter resembled a Junkers 88. Several such mistakes happened during the war. My squadron shared an airfield at Ford with a fighter interceptor unit and a small, experienced marine aviation fighter squadron. We seldom encountered sailors, but we often watched the men of the interceptor unit, which had been established to test new and upgraded airborne radars and to develop night fighter tactics. Ford was the perfect location for them. They often tested their equipment and theorizing in combat. There was a friendly rivalry between the 141st's interceptor fighters, and sometimes Styx and I and some of my most experienced crews would assist them in their tests. We were able to provide them with useful information. After only being in the squadron for three weeks, Styx and I had a night battle that was our last air combat in the Air Defence Force. All my future victories were over enemy-occupied Europe and Germany itself. Several weeks there was little night activity, and most of my squadron was on the ground. That night, many of the crews went to a party at Worthing. The fun was in full swing when the sirens howled. I called Ford and learned that the enemy had appeared and that the interceptors had already shot down one plane. We, loading into our vehicles, hurried to the airfield. Sector headquarters ordered one of my planes up and Styx and I ran to our waiting beat. It was a beautiful moonlit night and I remember thinking how stupid the Germans must be to send bombers on such a night, perfect for night fighters. The intercept proceeded as usual, and eventually the GCR operator and Styx worked together to bring me within visual detection range of a Darnier 217 at 4,600 metres. The night was so bright that at the same moment and the enemy saw our... He began to manoeuvre vigorously, turning now and then to one side or the other. Simultaneously, his rear gunners sprayed tracers in our direction, Fortunately, not very accurately. I was a bit excited and probably feeling the effects of the party we had left so hastily, so I started firing from too far away with no results. Stikes quickly put an end to my foolishness by firing off caustic comments over the intercom. It took four long bursts, nearly exhausting our ammunition. 
before the Dornier caught fire and went into a dive. It ended with a huge splash in the sea a few kilometres from shore. I was not pleased with myself when we got out of the plane. The Dornier nearly went off because of my poor shooting. However, the 141st performed admirably in friendly competition with the interceptors, and we shot down two of the three or four bombers attacked. One other airplane was destroyed, but no one claimed it. It was probably hit by our anti-aircraft artillery and didn't crash until some time later, so we couldn't determine who to award it to. Night raids were not frequent at that time, but the Germans took advantage of every day of bad weather conditions to attack targets on the coast during the daytime, sending in Fokulf 190 fighter bombers, Junkers 88 bombers and Dorier bombers. These raids, in addition to our night readiness and training flights, put a great strain on the squadron, especially now that we had so many inexperienced crews. Only five or six experienced veterans remained, and the main burden of day and combat night sorties fell on them. Cook and his radio operator, considered old men, had gained extraordinary experience during one of the German daylight raids. After a short pursuit, they near Chichester saw their target, a Dornier 217 flying at treetop level. The fighter Cook quickly caught up with the German, and he, in his eagerness to get away, did not notice the gas holder and crashed into it, followed by a huge explosion. Cook did not fire a single shot, but after some argument with his command, he was justly credited with the destroyed plane. We had little time to train the ever-increasing number of new recruits. In the combat training unit, crews were still receiving basic training on the Blenheims. The training course was reduced to a minimum because not only in England, but also in the Middle and Far East, more and more night fighter squadrons were being formed. I regretfully had to state that the 141st had to be transferred to a quieter area so that it would be possible to bring all our crews to a state of full combat readiness. I discussed this with the Link commanders, the Adjutant and Buster Reynolds, and they all agreed that if we remained at Ford any longer, the experienced crews would be completely exhausted and burned out. The enemy would then have complete freedom of action. Having made my decision, I requested a meeting with the commander of the air group. He understood me and agreed that the 141st should be sent to a quiet area. After a pleasant and friendly discussion, it was decided that in mid-February, the 141st would swap places with the 604th Squadron at Predanac on the Cornwall Peninsula. A few days before the redeployment, Styx and I flew to Predanac to discuss the changeover arrangements with Wing Commander Woods, the boss of the 64th. The airfield was located close to Land's End. The only runway was buried close to the cliffs overhanging the sea. The staff was stationed a few kilometres from the airfield, and the officers lived in a handsome hotel that had been requisitioned for the purpose. From its north-facing windows the ocean was visible. I also met with the air station commander and the commander of a squadron of boy fighters from Coastal Command, which shared Pradanic with us. Their mission was to attack enemy ships and aircraft in the Bay of Biscay. Woods reported that my squadron would operate two GCI radars, which both had excellent operators. This information set my thoughts in a good mood before returning to Ford. I was confident that two months at Predakshak would allow the squadron to acquire the highest degree of combat readiness. But I soon began to pester High Command with requests that we be brought back. Our squadron was to hand over its newer Bayer with Mike 7 radars to 604 Squadron at Ford and in return receive their older aircraft, many of which were fitted with the still early Mike A4 radars. It was a bittersweet experience as we were used to our airplanes, had grown to love them. But my despondency vanished when I learned from the engineer that the squadron had enough bups with my K-7 radars to conduct a satisfactory training program. We landed at Predanac on February 17, 1943. The training conditions there were ideal thanks to the cooperation of the GCI radar operators at Trelliver and Undy for, for weeks, day and night. We performed training intercepts and the 141st began to develop into an effective squadron. Until then, new crews could not benefit from the experience of the veterans because they were constantly overworked. Now the situation was different. The personnel at the two GCI stations not only unselfishly helped to improve our effectiveness against the enemy, but also spent their free time with us. Many of the charming female planchettes became constant friends of our po I had a constant thirst for combat sorties. Up to that time, only two squadrons of night fighters, which had no airborne radar, were allowed to patrol over enemy-occupied territory in search of planes coming in or taking off. 
They became known as intruder squadrons. However, because of the lack of radar and the ingenuity of the Germans in the use of false and decoy airfields, the successes achieved by these two squadrons were small. In meetings at Fighter Command and Air Group Headquarters, I insisted that the time had come when we should send airborne radar-equipped fighters to support our bombers over Europe. German night fighters were beginning to take a very heavy toll on Bomber Command, and I felt that by allowing our night fighters to escort the bomber streams, we could probably shoot down enough German fighters to reduce losses, but my arguments were not heeded. Even the suggestion to use only older models of airborne radar was rejected, at least at that time. When I realized with satisfaction that our night training program had progressed sufficiently, I decided to try again to get the squadron some limited offensive role. I visited our group headquarters near Bath to speak to the commanding officer, but he was away on sickness at the time, and I was escorted to his deputy air commodore Basil Embry, later to become air chief marshal. I had met this remarkable man with piercing grey-blue eyes before and knew of his reputation as an aggressive leader. I felt he would be receptive to my suggestions. Some of us in the 141st had suggested that if we couldn't use fighters with airborne radars over enemy territory, perhaps we could operate like these two intruder squadrons, using our old buys with dismounted raiders. I suggested to the Air Commodore that we support the squadron's war spirit and contribute to the overall war effort by allowing experienced crews to attack rail and road transport on the Brittany Peninsula on moonlit nights. Such sorties were known as ranger sorties. I also suggested that we be allowed to patrol during the day over the Bay of Biscay so that we could help Coastal Command track down the large Focky Wolf 200 scouts and bombers that were flying from the Bordeaux area and targeting our merchant ships with subs. To my delight, Imbri agreed to my suggestions, provided we continue to maintain our combat readiness as night fighters. I promised that we could handle it. When I went back to the squadron and told them about it, the effect was amazing. Never had the morale of 141 Squadron been so high. We waited patiently for the next full moon and on the night of March 20, we flew our first sortie under the Ranger designation. Only three airplanes took off and I took part in this first sortie. An officer at Air Group headquarters pointed out to us an area of France in which we were to patrol, looking for things to do. For the first time, we were assigned the railroad network on the Brittany Peninsula. Its southwestern lines were vital to the garrisons at Saint-Nazaire, Brest, Lorient and La Rochelle, which all remained German submarine bases. Our radio operators now became navigators, and together with Buster, our intelligence officer, we planned our patrol routes. According to the plan, we were to cross the English Channel at low altitude, then gain 460-600 metres altitude over the cliffs of the Brittany coast, then find a railroad line and start climbing. The distance to our target area was approximately 210 km, so we should have had enough fuel for an hour or so patrol. Sticks had been away from the squadron for nearly two months. Jacko couldn't leave Cranfield, so he took Flight Sergeant Blackburn, a New Zealander who had arrived relatively new to the squadron, as his navigator. Buster had so annoyed me before the flight that I took him as a passenger. As soon as it got dark, we climbed into our bug house and took off. This was the first time we were to take the war into enemy territory. It was a wonderful sensation. We flew about 90 meters above the water to make it difficult for German ground radars to detect us. Blackburn proved himself a skillful navigator, and after about 35 minutes I could see the rocky coast of Brittany. There was no opposition. As we continued to fly south, we saw farms, forests and villages. Then I spotted the main railroad line from Rep to Brest gleaming in the moonlight. This was our objective. I threw the Albu into a steep turn to fly eastward along the line. I was looking ahead for a clearly visible column of smoke from a steam locomotive. At 290 Campbell, I was guiding the heavy fighter from side to side to reduce the risk of a surprise attack by a German night fighter, although at this altitude it was unlikely. We had only been patrolling for a few minutes when I saw a thin streak of smoke giving a glow in the moonlight. It was evidently a train travelling at a fair speed. I wanted to catch it on a straight stretch of track hence performed a gentle U-turn on the view until the train was a little east of the town of Gigai. Now I could shoot unobstructed. Buster reminded me to be careful because most trains in occupied Europe had platforms with anti-aircraft guns. Now everything was ready. At an altitude of 600 metres, I put the view into a gentle dive and took aim at the steam locomotive. At an altitude of 300 metres, 
diving at a speed of 390 km. A.H., I pressed the fire button on the helm and gave a long line. Four cannons and six machine guns rumbled, and the view from their recoil slowed slightly. We saw shells and bullets knocking sparks and flames out of the locomotive. Suddenly it exploded, throwing up puffs of steam and smoke, gently taking the wheel and still firing. I let the deadly stream of fire run along the partially smoke-hidden train. Broken lines of red traces began to rise upward in our direction, and glowing flew nearby like whiplash. We circled at 900 meters altitude, out of range of anti-aircraft artillery, and saw the train come to a halt. The steam locomotive was spewing great clouds of steam from its ruptured innards. Satisfied, we turned for home and 45 minutes later returned to Predapnek. Shortly after us, other crews returned as well. The first shelled another train, and the other found nothing worthy of attack. Our first raids into enemy territory proved successful. Without loss on our part, we damaged two trains. The effect produced by this on flying and ground personnel was enormous. During March and April, the weather was generally good. Sometimes on free days in the Oxford, the squadron's liaison aircraft, we flew to the Seely Islands and landed at the small airfield on Septmary Island. I always looked forward to this pleasant outing. I fell in love with the daffodil-covered islands and their almost tropical climate. As we drank pints of beer and ate breakfast of butter and jam sandwiches in the warm sunshine, it was hard to imagine that there was a war going on somewhere nearby. Not so far away, thousands of people of different nationalities were involved in a bloody conflict. On other days, we visited Lieutenant Davis and his merry band of torpedo boat crews in the little harbour of Penzance, where they were on temporary rest after operations off the French coast. Now they were being used to rescue airplane crews who had fallen into the sea. They would take us on their speedboats as they cruised the waters of the Atlantic. In the evenings we would gather in one of the small cabins to drink and tell jokes until morning. If any of us were not feeling well after the rowdy fun in Penzance, these tiny boats became our hotel. Their patient boss and crews always welcomed us aboard and provided a bunk for the night. These good friends from the Navy visited us at the airfield and sometimes flew with us in the boy fighters. I think they enjoyed these visits as much as we enjoyed visiting them at Penzance. It took much less time for the squadron to reach a decent level of readiness for night fighting than I had originally thought, despite the influx of new crews. By the end of March, a month and a half after we arrived at Predanak, I felt that we were in reasonably good condition and therefore took steps to strengthen our offensive activity. Most of the crews were getting the opportunity to visit the Germans over areas occupied by them. We also flew many patrol flights over the Bay of Biscay. Usually during daylight hours we sent two airplanes in an open formation for mutual defence. These flights did not bring us luck and we suffered our first combat losses. A relatively new wing commander and an experienced NCO flew with their navigators on patrol to the mouth of the Gironde. They apparently encountered a large number of long-range Junkers 88 fighters, and both buys were shot down. We received information about this from our intelligence, which intercepted the chatter of the German squadron involved in this battle. It left no doubt as to the outcome of this battle. It was a serious blow to the squadron. The crews we had lost had enjoyed our affection, and we wanted revenge. Later intelligence revealed that the Germans may have been alerted to the appearance of our planes by so-called neutral Spanish fishing boats. Those of us who flew over the Bay of Biscay saw them. The thought of my crews being shot down because of the treachery of these men made my blood boil. The next morning I decided that despite the strict prohibition against attacking neutral ships, these men would need to be taught a lesson. I again selected Blackburn as navigator and informed the other experienced crew of my intention to retaliate. Their group headquarters, on the other hand, received word that we were out on a routine patrol. We took off just before breakfast, flying at an altitude slightly above the crests of the waves, keeping about 45 metres apart. We first set course for the Scilly Islands, then southwest, turned south 80 kilometres off the west coast of Brittany, and finally headed for the French coast near the mouth of the Gironde. From there we began patrolling over the sea 83 km from the coast. The extreme southern point of our flight was within sight of the northern coast of Spain. We flew as low as possible to prevent ourselves from being picked up by German ground raiders on the coast of France, to ensure surprise. I had advised before the flight that until we got into combat, or until some critical situation arose, radio silence was to be maintained. It was really hot work. 
In these southern waters, the sun turned our plexiglass-enclosed cockpits into greenhouses. Soon we were drenched in sweat. What was that? I asked Blackburn on the intercom, looking out at the eastern horizon. Yes, the masts of ships. I shook my wings, giving the prearranged signal and turned sharply toward them, gaining 460 meters altitude. My wingman followed me. In a couple of seconds, we were over several fishing boats. I could see from their flags that they were Spanish. All right, you bastards, we'll teach you to help the enemy. Gaining altitude again, I executed a turn accompanied by a second bow, picked one of the boats as a target and went into a dive. Taking aim, I flicked a switch, bringing my guns to ready. The range was rapidly closing, and then I noticed that someone was lying on the stern of the boat with his hands under his head, obviously sunbathing. I took my thumb off the fire button. Whoever the figure belonged to, man or woman, but it was very small. In the split second it was happening, it became clear to me that it was a child, probably the son or daughter of the owner of the boat who had no idea of our evil intention. Seeing the child I realized I couldn't shoot, breaking radio silence. I called Davis. Don't shoot. As we whizzed by at mast height, the child waved at us, completely unafraid. At this point the anger at the neutral supposed betrayal left me. Even though one of them might have been responsible for the deaths of two of my crew, I couldn't commit murder. Two hours later, we landed at Preden Park. I began to explain to the pilot of the second Bougieu why my hand had stopped. He asked, During March and April, we increased our ranger missions over France and also increased flying over the Bay of Biscay. Flight Lieutenant Le Boutet, one of our Belgian pilots, became an expert at assaulting trains. He soon proved to be the most effective in the squadron in this field. Before the war, a Boutet was a major in the Belgian Air Force. In 1940, during the German offensive, he escaped through France to Spain, spent a hard time in various prisons before reaching England, where he joined the Royal Air Force and was promoted to the temporary rank of flying lieutenant. He was a 40-year-old man who wore glasses, but he had a fighting spirit and courage far greater than many young lads. I never ceased to admire him, and after the war I was delighted to hear that he became Chief of Staff of the Belgian Air Force. His only desire was to shoot at the enemy as often as possible. It must be admitted, however, that at night many of our ground personnel had only to hope to God. Because of his poor eyesight, he did not accurately judge the speed of the airplane on the ground at night. He had a tendency to taxi to the parking lot at high speed, scaring the mechanics who would back up and try to point him to the right spot with flares. The technicians became very adept at running backwards. One moonlit night, we were returning from a patrol in the Bordeaux air after searching for the elusive condors. Flying over the sea at an altitude of 150 meters, I saw a long cigar-shaped object ahead in the water, a submarine. We were only 100 kilometers from Alachel, so we figured she was charging her batteries on the surface. I threw the Bue into a turn with an altitude gain. Since the submarine did not dive, her crew probably mistook us for a German airplane. I was sorry we had no conventional or depth bombs, but at least our 20 mm shells could penetrate the fuel tanks and ballast tanks and possibly kill some of the crew. At an altitude of 150 meters, I fired a long line. Bew shuddered and I saw flashes and sparks as our shells hit the boat. The Germans returned fire, firing an inaccurate line from the fighting deckhouse. I left with an altitude gain and began an approach for a second attack, but my target began to sink. We were too late and had to content ourselves with observing an oil slick on the water, which meant that the sub was at least damaged and would probably spend some time in the dock for repairs. There was little entertainment at uh, Prednak. One day the squadron was invited to a dance at Church Hall, and many of us went there. Dickie, Doc and myself, after a few beers at the Mullion Cove Hotel, thought we should show up at the dance too. It was a pleasant night, and we decided to walk. On the way we spotted a horse peacefully dozing in a field. It occurred to us that if we borrowed this animal and rode it to the dance we would liven things up. After a little persuasion Doc and I saddled the surprised animal. Dickie led it on a rope to the dance hall. We knocked, the door opened, and we rode in riding our horse. Pandemonium broke out, the horse spooked, and all of us. The riders, the horse, and our escorting adjutant left the hall rather hastily. We returned the capricious animal to his field. For a long time we had been annoyed by a single Junker's 88 reconnaissance airplane. It took off from Brittany, 
then passed along the western boundary of our ground radar range and continued to fly further along the west coast of Ireland. Among other things, this airplane collected weather data for the Luftwaffe and the German Navy. Our friends in the 248th Squadron of Coastal Command, whose bows shared the airfield with us, tried several times to intercept this airplane. Once they succeeded, but at great cost, one Bujou was lost, another returned badly damaged, but they destroyed the Junkers 88. However, soon the place of this worthy opponent was taken by another airplane. It was necessary to do something about it. Unfortunately, it was very briefly in the coverage area of our GCI radars, and it was impossible to intercept it unless the buff fighters were in the right place at the right time. The headquarters of our air group, in conjunction with the Navy, developed a plan that would place a patrol ship on the flight path of our insidious friend. It was equipped with primitive radar and had a Royal Air Force radio operator on board. If the sea was relatively calm and the radar could be used, this plan seemed to have a future. As soon as information was received that a Junkers 88 was taking to the air, we were to take off urgently in a buoy, establish contact with the operator on the patrol ship, and then patrol and wait for the enemy to appear on the radar screen. This particular airplane became known as the Milk Train because of the precise timing of its appearance. But no matter how hard we tried, we were never able to get really close to it. The German squadron flying these flights was extremely experienced and knew all our tricks. We were a happy and relaxed squadron. Only once did I have to take disciplinary action against one of our Australian pilots. I was having breakfast with the air station commander in the dining room of our hotel when from our seats we saw a solitary bufighter approaching the building at our window height. For a split second I thought it was going to hit us, but it began to gain altitude and roared over the roof. The old man was deathly pale. Hmm. Find out this man's name and I'll have him court-martialed. I cooled him down and he agreed to let me handle the case myself. When I saw the culprit, I reprimanded him in strong terms. Jose seemed sincerely remorseful, and remembering my own similar misconduct some time ago, I confined myself to Up to this time, I had never come face to face with the appearance of cowardice. I had heard of it occurring in other squadrons, but I had never expected it to occur in my own. When, having briefed two crews before patrolling over the Bay of Biscay, I returned to my office, the adjutant informed me that Sauvier, one of our new pilots, wanted to see me. This was one of the crewmen I had just briefed. He was clearly uncomfortable. Sauvier said that since I had left the squadron parking lot, my instructions had been changed and he was sure they would not be able to reach my assigned patrol area. I thanked him for his loyalty and promised to look into it all. I sent for the lead crew who had been ordered to lead this patrol flight and asked them what they were thinking in changing my instructions. The navigator, who was bolder, said that my route was laid out too close to the enemy's coast and therefore too dangerous. I ordered them to fly at minimum altitude over the water and no closer than 80 kilometers from the French coast. There was a one in a thousand chance that they would be spotted by German fighter patrols, and that was considered an acceptable risk. We had flown this route before, and it was the only way to reach the patrol area in the southern bay of Biscay and stay there for any length of time. To my surprise, the navigator then said that he had been trained as an airborne radar operator with the stipulation of always flying over England. He was unwilling to risk his neck and test fate. I couldn't believe my ears. Are we in a war or not? Unfortunately, I lost my temper and told him to get out and wait in the adjutant's office. The pilot, the squadron leader, appeared to be under the influence of his navigator. He now seemed a little agitated, saying that he would insist on executing the flight as directed. I could see, however, that he was not happy to fly the bow. He felt that he had not mastered this airplane and would like to transfer to a Stirling bomber squadron. I could understand his fear of bow. It had happened before that someone was afraid to fly one type of airplane, but then successfully operated another. I had noticed that flying a Bougeau over the Bay of Biscay was much safer than flying a bomber, especially a Stirling, over Germany. But he insisted that he would like to fly a Stirling. I promised him assistance, but I was negatively impressed by the total lack of tact and morale he showed to the new crew in changing my instructions. It was obvious that this crew could not be sent on a flight, so I selected another as lead, and they then returned safely to Predanak after a fruitless patrol. In the meantime, after discussion with the adjutant, my father confessor I had prepared a letter to Air Group headquarters 
regarding these two officers indicating, using service terminology, that they lacked morale. Because of the seriousness of the matter and its possible consequences for the less experienced members of the squadron, I made a preliminary phone call to Embry before sending the letter. The acting group commander did not accept the pilot's request for a transfer, saying that if he didn't want to fly a BGW, more than likely he wouldn't want to fly anything in combat at all. I disagreed with the Air Commodore but could not change his mind. Within 24 hours, both officers left the airfield and were sent to other squadrons for trials. I never heard from them again. A new crew arrived to replace them, and to my delight the pilot in it was Vini, an old friend of mine from my days at Devon and now a squadron leader. Along with him arrived his radio operator, Flight Lieutenant Scott. Scotty's face twitched and was initially jeered at in the squadron, but he was complacent towards the Jokers. His attitude toward the facial twitch was as follows. What do you want to gain by having to fly with a fruit like Wynne? Stikes returned from his squadron course, just in time to visit with me and Buster at the Bristol Aircraft Company Aircraft Factory at Filton. We were to represent the crews flying the company's aircraft and were expected to address a large group of workers in one of the canteens. I dreaded public speaking, but was able to mutter a few appropriate words, thanking the audience on behalf of the crews for providing us with such fine airplanes as the Bufighters. I spoke sincerely, but because I felt inadequate as a speaker, I dropped the bomb on sticks by asking him to say a few words. From the look he gave me, I should have dropped dead, but he soon had the crowded dining room laughing at his jokes, most of which were directed at me. I earned it by unexpectedly granting him the right to make a speech. Such visits, no doubt, did a lot of good and encouraged the workers who were getting a little honour for their hard work. On the afternoon of April 10, information came from the nearby Coastal Command Air Group headquarters that one of our long-range reconnaissance planes had spotted a large German armed raider in the Bay of Biscay which, accompanied by escort ships from the southwest, was approaching the mouth of the Gironde. A strike group was immediately organised, consisting of Hempton torpedo carriers from the Royal Canadian Air Force Squadron and six bubs from the Coastal Command Squadron at Preda. The BUK were to suppress anti-aircraft fire. The staff officer asked me if I'd like to help them with three of my boo. The answer was yes. Our task was the same as that of the Coastal Command Bujou, to bombard the escort ships. This time Styx was on vacation, so I took Blackburn as navigator again. Doc Dougal had been pestering me to take him along, so I let him fly as a passenger. The other two crews were selected, and after coordinating the plan with the view of the Coast Command Squadron, I instructed them. We took off, and after a short interval were followed by our friends from Coastal Command. We flew in a broad front in two separate groups several kilometres apart, the 141st in the vanguard. When we over the Sealy Islands reached the rendezvous point with the torpedo bombers, there was no sign of them. I decided to fly on with the planned route, hoping to eventually encounter them. For 45 minutes we saw only water as we glided only 15 metres over the Atlantic Ocean, and I was beginning to think that this sortie was a waste of time. Doc, who was looking over my shoulder, was the first to notice something. Hmm, what's that over the horizon? I saw little puffs of smoke in the distance. My God, those are anti-aircraft guns. The Hemptons must be there by now. I drove my group at top speed. A few seconds later, we could make out the masts of the ships. One large one, accompanied by several smaller ones, which from light and heavy anti-aircraft guns, were making a terrific barrage in front of the torpedo carrier planes. The convoy manoeuvred desperately to get away. A powerful burst, accompanied by oily smoke, marked the grave of one of the torpedo carriers. None of the vessels, as far as we could see, had any damage. We were still several kilometres away, and the Germans had not yet spotted us because we were approaching fast and at low altitude, our propellers kicking up salt water dust. I called the leader of the Bue from Coastal Command to join us in the escort attack. We could only break through the heavy barrage of anti-aircraft fire if different ships attacked at the same time. To my dismay, he replied that he considered the torpedo attack virtually over and was going to lead his planes home. There was no point in discussing this over the radio. I called up both my crews and directed them to attack the patrol ships. A small destroyer was 1.5 kilometres in front of me, and I chose it as my target. Still, none of the anti-aircraft guns seemed to turn toward us. The ships concentrated on the Hampton. 
Once at a range of 800 meters, I opened fire, and the ship began to turn to the right, stern to us to reduce its silhouette. At the same time, a stream of red fireballs raced toward us, not only from his anti-aircraft guns, but also from the other ships in the convoy. The air was filled with metal, and I didn't understand how we managed to avoid being hit. I pressed the fire button with my thumb, and the four guns began spewing armor-piercing and fragmentation shells at a rate of 700 rounds per minute. Our plane filled with cordit vapors, which I barely noticed as I concentrated on keeping the ship in my sights. At first, the fountains of water were only behind the ship. My fire was a little inaccurate. Still keeping my thumb on the fire button, I pulled the helm slightly toward me to get a better aim. The ship was now covered in flashes of fire and puffs of smoke from shell hits from our guns. We were approaching at 370 car, and the Nazi ship was getting bigger and bigger. The return fire from its guns stopped. The crew must have died or sought protection from our murderous fire. The air was filled with bursting shells as the rest of the convoy tried to shoot down my comrades. For a second or so, I was spared from the fire from the other ships as I was very close to their own ship. I flew as low as I dared, firing all the time. At the last moment, when it seemed as if we would crash into the stern of the vessel, I took the helm and miraculously leaped over the mast. Then, making a steep right turn, we spun down to the surface of the water and turned westward away from the convoy at top speed. As we left, all hell broke loose. All the Nazis jumped on us for revenge. Make their job harder, sir. Maneuver, Blackburn's voice came over the intercom, reminding me of the anti-reverse maneuver. Large columns of water rose around us as the light anti-aircraft guns were joined by the ship's heavy guns. One or two shells exploded near us, rocking the airplane dangerously. With a sharp metallic scraping sound, shards of hot metal pierced the most important places of our good old boat. Finally, we were out of range. Are you all right? Doc and Blackburn replied that they were fine. Nerdy Blah, did you see our other two airplanes? No, oh, I don't think either of them survived, sir. As we approached our target, I saw one surrounded by bursts of anti-aircraft shells for a second, then there was a big splash of water in its area. The second one I didn't see at all. My heart skipped a beat. This was really bad. It seemed it was beginning to get dark. The ship we had attacked seemed to have lost control and was slowly going in circles, smoking but still afloat. All the other vessels looked unharmed. My first priority was to try to contact our other crews. I called them on the radio. McCaptrew, the pilot of one of the buys, answered immediately and reported that he was doing well and was also on his way home. The other crew did not respond. I hoped and prayed that he would survive, even if captured. I later learned that this plane had been shot down by heavy anti-aircraft artillery fire and had fallen into the sea. Two hours later, Mac and I landed our buoys at Predanuk. Both planes were damaged by anti-aircraft shell fragments, but suffered no serious damage. I fired five 2020 cells in one long burst, almost six seconds of continuous fire. It was the longest burst fired during the entire war. The average duration of one Q in combat was two to three seconds. This was justified as we damaged a German warship. Overall, however, I considered the sortie a failure, mainly because of errors in the timing of the exit to the rendezvous point and the resulting lack of coordination during the attack. The armed raider got away unharmed. This sortie cost us the loss of one Bu and one Hempton. Several hemp depths returned badly damaged with wounded crew members. I was worried about the loss of our crew and felt that this would not have happened if the Coastal Command Buguases had participated in the attack. I expressed my opinion rather harshly to their squadron commander who, because of the importance of the sortie, was supposed to personally lead his planes. In fact, his planes were led by one of the experienced NCOCUL crew. This incident caused strained relations between our two squadrons at Predanak for several days, but they returned to goodwill when their squadron commander was removed by his command. His place was taken by one of the squadron commanders, a superb Bu assault leader, I received a call for a meeting at Fighter Command Headquarters at Stanmore. The staff officer said he could not tell me the subject of the meeting over the phone, leaving me puzzled. The next morning I flew out with Buster Reynolds in one of our squadron's bujus. A staff car was waiting at North Oltena's and quickly took us to Bentley Prairie, 
the vast old estate that served as the headquarters and think tank of fighter command. Buster and I were escorted into one of the conference rooms where we were introduced to a host of senior officers and two civilians, one of whom I recognized as an employee of a communications research facility from Deford, near Mer I was told at once that my squadron had been selected for new operations, designated Serrate, a special Royal Air Force unit, with aircraft carrying secret electronic equipment, spent all its time trying to intercept and determine the frequencies of enemy radios and radars. From time to time it undertook dangerous flights over or near enemy territory to gain valuable information. It seemed that they were able to determine the frequency of the airborne radars used by German night fighters. Using their data, scientists at the Communications Institute developed a device that, when used in conjunction with our airborne radar, allowed us to pick up the location of German night fighters whenever they turned on their radars. Fighter Command decided to equip the BU of 141 Squadron with these black boxes and send them out with the bomber streams. Our task was to shoot down or drive away as many German night fighters as possible, which were beginning to inflict heavy blows on our bombers. I suggested that we equip other squadrons with serrate devices at the same time so that we could send more airplanes to do battle with German night fighters. However, it was decided at the meeting that since we did not yet know that much about this black box, only my squadron would use it. Predanak was not an ideal location for such sorties. The squadron would have to be closer to the centre of things, so at the end of April we would have to move to Wittering where the planes would be fitted with black boxes. We then discussed what to do with our own airborne radars. It was understood by all that we could not afford to risk losing our state-of-the-art radars over enemy territory, and hence my would-be would have to use the MiK-4 model. The few aircraft equipped with MK-7 radars will be replaced by earlier modifications. After the wonderful news regarding these operations, I took this as only a minor obstacle. The squadron was now to be in the thick of things, and if we could keep just a few of our bombers away from the enemy, it would give us great satisfaction. After the meeting, I was literally out of breath with excitement and could hardly wait for the day when we would leave for Wittering. But I had no right to tell anyone about it except my two link commanders, Davis and Wimp, as the operation was top secret. Returning to Predanak in the late afternoon, I invited them both over and reported the substance of the meeting, warning them that they must remain silent until we arrived at our new airfield in two weeks. Then the rest of the squadron could be privy to what was going on. During the last two weeks at Predanak, I flew another sortie under the designation of Ranger. I took Blackburn as navigator and Buster as passenger. On that bright moon at night, we again searched for road or railroad traffic on the Brittany Peninsula. The only moving object we could see during this patrol was a truck on the highway southeast of Brest. One short burst from our guns and it crashed into a roadside ditch, turning into smoking wreckage. On the way home, we saw three torpedo boats coming at high speed in a keel water formation. I brought the BU into position to attack the trailing boat at an altitude of 900 meters went into a dive and from a distance of 300 meters opened fire. There was a loud bang and a bright flash for a moment illuminated the inside of the Buju. It was accompanied by a shock wave. Initially I thought that we had been hit by anti-aircraft fire from torpedo boats or we had been fired upon by an undetected German night fighter. Taking the plane out of dive, I turned toward the coast of England and on the intercom called Blackburn and Buster to find out if they were all right. Buster answered, There's a big hole in the bottom of the fuselage. Okay, we'd better get back to base. Yes. Be alert, Blackburn. There might be a fighter jet out there. The hole explained the wind walking in the fuselage, but I wasn't sure of the cause of it and for a while tossed our plane from side to side in case there was a German night fighter nearby. Forty-five minutes later, our damaged Buju landed at Predanak. Inspection revealed that as I pressed the fire button to fire the torpedo boat, a twentim shell exploded in the drum of one of our guns. The damage was not very serious, but certainly spectacular. The cannon seemed to have been torn in half, and a large hole was created in the fuselage directly below it. Once a month, the air defense sector commander invited the air station commander and me to his place in Portrith to discuss administrative and combat problems. In the last days of the squadron's stay in Predanak, we received such an invitation and flew out to see him. It was a routine meeting, and after lunch we headed back to our airfield. While making a circle over Predanak before our approach, we noticed, to our horror, 
the smoking wreckage of an airplane scattered near one of the 141st's parking lots. I called the control tower and asked if it was one of my airplanes. Oh, I'm sorry, sir, but I'm afraid it was. I landed as quickly as I could and went to the crash site. The firemen were still blasting the smouldering wreckage that dotted the large area. The pilot was Jose, whom only a few weeks earlier I had reprimanded for flying over the officers' mess hall in our hotel. With him was the unfortunate Blackburn, who had been in many battles with me. I was told that the pilot, who was the deputy wing commander, was leading two other buys in a tight formation during a training flight. They were flying in a wedge, and Ozai led them over the airfield several times at extremely low altitude, despite warnings from the control tower not to do so. During one of these passes, he descended too low, and the wing tip of his airplane caught the roof of the barracks Nissan. At high speed, the Bu crashed into the ground. The crews of the other two planes realized they were flying too low and went out of action. This stupid incident, which cost the lives of the crew, could easily have had more tragic consequences, because there were people in the barracks. I should have felt sadness at the death of the pilot, but all I felt was anger. He had been given another chance after a gross breach of flight discipline, but as soon as I slackened my attention, he failed the squadron again. He was also responsible for the death of a fine navigator who had just been awarded the Distinguished Flying Medal and nearly killed many others. Blackburn's wife came to Pradechek the next day and I told her, as gently as I could, that there had been an accident and that her husband had died instantly. At least my last words were true. Unfortunately, I doubt if she believed me, as she had already met with several sergeants among her husband's friends. They had hinted to her that he was killed because of the pilot's stupidity. She later attended the funeral ceremony. It was then that I informed her that Blackburn had just been awarded the Distinguished Flying Medal for Bravery. There were no tears in her eyes when she bitterly said, No, what good is it now? Blackburn meant a lot to me as a person, and the way he died made such an impression on me that I couldn't say anything coherent in response to her question. I was assisted by Dickie and Doc, who did all they could to relieve the poor woman's suffering. The few remaining days at Predanak were spent by us practicing night sorties and preparing planes for relocation. In the meantime, the few BUs with MK, seven radars were replaced by aircraft with Mike t 4s I also received a letter from Air Commodore Embry congratulating me on being awarded a second buckle to the Distinguished Flying Cross for my successes in our recent offensives. Personally, I felt that this award belonged to the whole squadron as everyone had performed admirably. Before leaving for Wittering, I made the promised visit to the Institute at Defford to discuss the technical details of the serrate instruments with Mr. Williams, a diminutive native of Wales and a brilliant scientist who was of great help to us later. Finally, on the last day of April, 141 Squadron took off from Predanak for the last time to fly to Wittering. As our 16 airplanes assembled in a group, set course for our new home, I felt regret. At Predanak, the squadron had been rejuvenated and had forever abandoned thoughts of its second-rate status. But there was no point in looking back. Besides, the future looked rosy. Wittering was a large grass airfield with one of the longest runways in the country. Because of its length, it was often used by bombers returning damaged from raids over Europe, as it gave exhausted and sometimes wounded crews maximum room for landing errors. They had no fear of popping up outside the airfield. Our new boss was Group Captain Leg, a tall, friendly man. He and his staff immediately began to do their best to make us feel at home. Wittery Air Station was a pre-war building, with permanent hangars and barracks which had sustained only minor damage during the bombing raids. However, for reasons of necessary precaution, the parking areas for our planes were scattered some distance from the permanent structures. We placed airplanes in hangars only when major repairs were necessary. We were generously provided with motorized transportation to move around the air station. The first couple of weeks were devoted to familiarization flights and the installation of serrate instruments on the aircraft. I spent most of my time planning future operations. I quickly came to the conclusion that the 141st should be given complete freedom of action. Operationally, the squadron reported directly to fighter command headquarters, bypassing the usual reporting to air group and air defense sector headquarters. On the morning or afternoon before departure, Bomber Command Headquarters contacted the Fighter Command Control Center at Stepmore. From there, 141 Squadron was to be informed by telephone of the target of the raid, the route of the flight, the types and number of bombers, 
and the time of their arrival at the target. Stikes, who was now the squadron's flying lieutenant and senior radio operator, Intelligence Officer Buster Reynolds, and I would plot this data on a master map in the crew's pre-flight briefing room and plan the squadron's tactics for that night. When most of our aircraft were equipped with serrate instruments, Mr. Williams advised that we should fly to an airfield farther from the enemy coast to practice, using the instruments there against a few DFIIs equipped with German airborne radar simulators. He felt that if we practiced at Wittering, there was a chance that the enemy, through his radio interception service, would be able to detect what we were doing. If the Germans realized that we knew the frequency of their airborne radar, they would have time to change it and nullify our chances of success. The importance of this suggestion was taken into account by Fighter Command headquarters, which made arrangements for the squadron to relocate to Dram, near North Berwick in Scotland. The flight was to take place in mid-May. In the meantime, I, with my two link commanders, Wynne and Davies, and with Styx, visited the headquarters of Bomber Command, 5th and 8th Air Groups, to talk about the planned action and to get any useful information about the tactics of our bombers and German night fighters. On the whole, these were useful visits, although we were left with the impression that they felt that one squadron was not enough to have much effect. We were in disagreement with this opinion. Even a few of our night fighters flying in and around the stream of bombers would have caused confusion to the German defences. It was also likely that our presence would prevent individual German night fighter crews from effectively attacking our bombers. However, we all recognised that it would be better if we could enter this phase of the action with a force larger than a single squadron. The other problem that seemed to bother the bomber command guys was that we would probably be shot at by the crews of our own bombers, mistaking us for enemy fighters in the heat of battle. As noted, this was an acceptable risk. We could not require the bomber crews to wait until the fighter approached and could be correctly identified. It would be too late for them if the approaching fighter turned out to be German. Prior to the flight to Drum, we continued training flights to practice night combat tactics, emphasizing collision with fighter-type aircraft. We assumed that the crews of German Messerschmitt 110 and Junkers 88 fighters, with their airborne radars, would be able to detect our presence as we approached them so surprise attacks seemed unlikely. After a week or so, the squadron had gained considerable experience in night maneuver combat. Pairs of chased each other in the dark skies. Radio operators continuously transmitted information to their pilots about the other fighter's position, and both crews tried to get within visual detection range. Usually the training battle was won by the pilot who first visually detected the other. Shooting theory and practice was very important because we were now to shoot at manoeuvring targets. All of our planes were equipped with movie cameras synchronized with the sights, so that when we performed training attacks in daylight, they could record the accuracy or inaccuracy of our firing. In this way, we could see if we were making too much or too little of a preposition when firing, and the experience gained enabled us to make great strides in subsequent training firings and later in combat. In the third week of May, when the last of my airplanes was fitted with the serrate instrument, we flew to drum. Landing there reminded me of 1940, when I was covering convoys in the Firth of Forth Bay, with 29 squadrons. It was a black time for England then. We were about to be unceremoniously kicked out of Norway. Now, in the spring of 1943, the gods of war were smiling on the Allies and there were signs of victory everywhere. I met with the commander of the Special Unit of Defiance, with whom we were to work for the next few weeks. I was delighted to discover that this was my friend back in 29 Squadron, Ian Esplin an Australian flying lieutenant. He had served with me as deputy wing commander. Ian was an experienced night fighter pilot and was well aware of the need to learn the new equipment as quickly as possible. Together, we drew up a flight program that allowed all crews of the squadron to acquire skills of effective joint use of Serrat devices and their onboard radars. Despite the intense training program at DREM, 141st Squadron found plenty of time to rest. We rested as intensely as we worked, and from time to time our overexcited moods caused us a little trouble. The managers of the station hotel in North Berwick took the squadron under her wing, and the hotel's pleasant bar became a favourite place for our gatherings. In this bar we encountered a naval officer who made some derogatory remarks about the Royal Air Force in general, and 141 Squadron in particular. He was rather rudely silenced. Later that evening we met him again at the local officer's club, and once more he had to be forcibly addressed. He was persistent and would not be silenced. The methods by which we silenced him did not find favour with the local Scottish officers and their ladies, so we had to leave. 
However, our honour was restored and we were satisfied. I learned later that rumours of our adventures had reached the ears of the air station commander at Dram. On another occasion, about a dozen officers of the squadron went on bicycles to a nearby pub. After a pleasant evening spent playing darts with the locals, we were on our way back to Dram. It was dark and we didn't have any lights, but we decided we could have a race on the way to our officers' mess. Eventually, hyped up by the competition, we arrived one by one at the mess hall, just in time for a dinner of good old scrambled eggs and bacon. The last to arrive was Charles Vinny, with a bloody and swollen face. Hmm, what's the matter, Vinny? Oh, oh, I thought I could do better without the use of my hands. Obviously, I was wrong. Vinny lost control of his bike and hit the road with his chin, knocking out one of his front teeth. His ugly face twisted into a toothless grin as he tossed his bloody trophy onto the dining room table in front of me. A souvenir, he said. My interest in the bacon and eggs was suddenly gone. We got the news that an undamaged Junkers 88 night fighter had landed at an airfield in England. The crew had had enough and decided to wait for the end of the war as prisoners of war. Our interest from this was that we now had the German airborne radar in working order, and our scientists were soon able to confirm that its frequency was the one they had previously calculated from radio intercept and radar data on the scout planes. This unexpected good fortune gave us the feeling that our future actions against enemy night fighters would be an immediate success. I was to fly out for another meeting at Fighter Command headquarters. Group Captain Tubby Person, who was in charge of night operations, wanted to know firsthand what progress we had made in our training. I told him that I believed we had summarized all the available information and had refined our tactics to the best of our ability under test conditions. When he asked if I thought the squadron was ready to meet the enemy, I replied, Yes. He then said that within the next few days I and the squadron could return to Wittering and within a fortnight should prepare for action. This was wonderful news. I was about to leave Person's office, but he detained me, saying that he had heard that we had overdone the liquor at Dram and asked my opinion of it. I asked where he got that information from and he said that the air station commander had personally informed him of it by telephone. Never before had the air station commander at Dram brought such misbehaviour to my attention, although I knew that some of us were excessively fond of liquor. I managed to convince Person that everything was all right and under control. He took my word for it, and I never heard from him again. But on my return to Drums, I brought it to the attention of my entire staff as a precaution. We didn't want to lose the chance of being the first squadron to use serrate instruments in combat. Then the eve of leaving Dram, I became a father again. The baby turned out not to be the planned Wendy, but a boy. It wasn't as if we had never thought of a suitable name for a boy. Perhaps the answer was to have a real Bob in the family, so I wrote Joan and suggested that we call him Robert. I couldn't make it home at the time due to urgent business but the name Robert was agreed when I managed to get a few free days after returning to Wittering. We soon came to regard Wittering as our new home. Despite the wartime restrictions, we lived well, thanks to the abundance of partridges and pheasants in the area, which we hunted quite casually and illegally. To the surrounding landowners, I apologised miserably, but at least they could be assured that these illegal additions to our diet did much for our morale, apart from training our eyes for shooting of a more serious kind. Our group and captain was also generous. A passionate fisherman, he would get up very early in the morning to fish for trout in a nearby river. He would often offer us a portion of his catch for lunch or luncheon. His hobby, unlike our poaching, was perfectly legal. He had a permit to fish in the local rivers. Soon we made our first sortie using serret devices. On the afternoon of June 14, word came that a large formation of bombers would raid industrial sites at Oberhusep. In the, we were given full freedom of action within the squadron's tactics. I wrote down all the information about the bombers' flight paths and called a meeting of all the senior officers. We felt disappointed when the squadron engineer said that only six aircraft could be used because, as expected, there were many problems with the new serrate instruments. Styx and I were to participate in this sortie. My squadron commanders selected five other crew. We agreed that we could stay close to our bomber friends longer if we took off from an airfield as close to the east coast as possible. So we decided to fly to Caltis Hall near Norwich and refuel there. Despite all we had learned in DREM from the scientists, there was still much that could only be learned in battle. We believed that the best way to achieve surprise was to get up into the stream of bombers and then equalize our speed with theirs. 
That way, enemy ground raiders and night fighter crews would not be able to detect our highly effective fighters until we were engaged. The selected crews were called in for briefing. I noticed the absence of the usual, somewhat strange cheerfulness before the flight. I could sense how focused everyone was. We weren't going to fool ourselves. The superiority of the enemy, at least on paper, was enormous. At least a hundred German fighters against our six airplanes. However, it was not as bad as it looked because our trump card remained the surprise and confusion we could cause. The backbone of German air defence was the several radar belts surrounding the Third Reich. The most effective was the outer one. It went along the northern coast of Holland, then down through the Bay Iselma, through Belgium and France. To Paris, then turned east and near the German-French border bumped into Switzerland. The Luftwaffe's air defence control system was capable of controlling a very large number of night fighters generously scattered at airfields throughout Germany and occupied Europe. Also, heavy anti-aircraft artillery and concentrated searchlights were deployed at strategic points, mostly around industrial areas and cities. On our map in the briefing room, the entire Ruhr was covered by a large red spot, indicating one of the most powerful areas of anti-aircraft fire in the world. Air combat could probably have taken place on the way to and from Oberhessen, since German night fighters tended not to enter the main target areas, giving free rein to the anti-aircraft artillery located there. We believed that anti-aircraft fire brought less disturbance than night fighters. At Kaltischl, we ran into some of our old friends. This airfield was the base of the 68th Squadron, one of many air defence night fighter units. They had a general no-details idea regarding our new job and were quite obviously jealous of our good fortune. However, this squadron had much more fun than most other night fighter squadrons because it was located near coastal convoy routes and a very short distance north of Harrisha. It occasionally encountered German planes dropping sea mines. We were not due to take off until 11.30 p.m. and had quite enough time to leisurely eat our supper, but because of the excitement we could not linger long at the table. I am sure our new hosts at Kaltish all understood our feelings. Once again, we wanted to make sure that everything was all right with our abuses, which we inspected with tender attention. We then began to wait impatiently for takeoff. The moon was high and the night was very bright when at about 11.15 p.m. We heard the rumble of the engines of many airplanes flying overhead. At an altitude of several thousand meters, we could vaguely make out dozens of Lancasters or Halifaxes gaining altitude on an eastward course toward the German arsenal of Ruher. Hundreds of huge machines carrying a devastating cargo were to meet over the North Sea and the stream of aircraft would stretch. It seemed in an endless line, about 160 kilometers. Those who, because of navigational errors, would be an easy target for enemy fighters. I looked at my watch. OK, let's go. Styx and I boarded our buju. After the control tower authorised takeoff, we were to maintain radio silence until we returned to England. As we gained altitude, Styx watched on his radar for signs of a mass of bombers that must have been in the vicinity. He soon informed me that he had many contacts all around us. The bombers were scattered at altitudes between 3,000 and 5,500 metres. We decided to level the plane at 3,700 metres because according to the information we received from Bomber Command Headquarters, the enemy tended to attack low-flying bombers most intensely. We sailed slowly over the North Sea, and I could see the moon below us reflected in the unfriendly pods. Thirty minutes later, the vague outline of the Dutch coast, near the mouth of the Skeld, showed itself. We were exactly on course. As always, Stix's navigation was impeccable. The countryside below us was drowning in darkness, Although on nights like this we were easy to navigate, rivers, canals and even railroad lines were clearly visible. Up ahead I could see the fumbling beams of a few searchlights, but there was nothing else that seemed hostile. We knew that on the ground the Luftwaffe control centres were already transmitting orders to the night fighter airfields for urgent takeoff of fighter squadrons. At that moment, everywhere in Holland, Belgium and West Germany, Messerschmitt 110s, and Junkers 88 were roaring down the runways to meet their hated opponents. But only this time they were unaware that there were six Boo fighters lurking in the stream. Styx was now continuously monitoring the airborne radar and serrate indicators. Hmm. I'm seeing a lot of signs of night fighters, Bob. I'm picking the strongest signal. Turn right 10 degrees and let's see if we can detect it. We're now following the pulses emitted by the German airborne radar. 
The technical capabilities of the Serrate did not allow us to know how far or close the airplane was until we could detect it with our radar, but we could know its position in space relative to us. The bursts of anti-aircraft shells appeared in the distance, and the bombers in front of us were now under fire. Sorry, Bob, that signal's gone. But I've got another one, left twenty degrees. I turned the IBUE on a new course, and suddenly the plane began to chatter as we got caught in the swirl from the propellers of another plane flying ahead. I could see nothing. Poet was probably one of our bombers. Again, there was a short pursuit, but no success. The Serrate signal disappeared, but there were always others indicating the presence of a large number of enemy fighters. It seemed that the enemy turned on their airborne radars only for short intervals. By this time, we were approaching the Ruhr. The anti-aircraft fire ahead was becoming more intense, and the bombers were beginning to be relieved of their cargo. Fires and explosions were visible from many kilometers away. It was Oberhausen that was receiving the death blows, but this was not a one-sided battle. There was a bright flash in the sky to the right, and a flaming comet hurtled toward the ground. I marked the spot and reprimanded myself. It was probably one of our bombers. Keep a close eye on the instruments, Stikes. Lots of Huns around. Ahead, a new fire appeared in the sky. Gradually descending, it crashed into the ground, raising a column of flame that mocked the grave of another plane. The atmosphere was heating up. We were close to the blazing ruins of Oberhausen, and the sky above us was filled with bursts of anti-aircraft shells and flares dropped by the pathfinders to indicate to the main force where to drop bombs. There were so many bombers over the city that it was useless for the German anti-aircraft gunners to aim at individual planes. They were putting up a steel curtain, hoping to throw back their tormentors. This was in vain. The raid continued. The leading bombers had already set a course for home. Passing the edge of the burning city, we turned to follow them. So far, I saw only fleeting dark shadows as we passed close to one or two of our bombers, though we flew through the swirling currents of the air crews of many planes crossing notes, it seemed, in a fruitless search for German fighters. Then Sticks, with excitement in his voice, reported, Bob, I see another signal, a smooth turn to the left. Maneuvering, I saw three burning planes in the air. I knew that our bombers rarely shot down German night fighters, so I could only assume that it was the enemy avenging us for the raid. Hey, Bob, I think he's behind us. The signal's strong. Do you see anything on the radar? No, but it's still turning. It was an eerie feeling, knowing we were playing deadly hide-and-seek with an invisible enemy. Bob, radar contact 1,800 meters behind. Steep left as far as you can. Are you sure it's not one of our bombers? Yeah, it's not. Radar and serrate signals match. Keep turning, he's about 900 meters and 20 degrees to the left, and a little higher. We're closing fast, and you should see him in a second. He's only 540 meters away, up across. I see him. I see him. I wailed excitedly. In the moonlight, I caught a glimpse of the airplane to my left. At that moment, the pilot leveled the machine, heading south at an altitude of 3,000 meters. It was a Messer Schmidt 110. He may have lost me on his radar. I opened fire from a range of 360 meters and, keeping behind him, gradually reduced the reproach so that the crosshairs of my electric sight moved across his fuselage. Explosions appeared along the entire length of the Messer. It caught fire and went into a steep dive. Styx, who by this time had raised his head from his office, shouted triumphantly as he saw our enemy crash into the ground. But there was no time to relax. By Styx, keep monitoring your instruments. There's a large number of creepers around, checking our location. I noted that the Messerschmitt 110 had gone down on the northeast shore of Iselma Bay. We had been in the air for almost three hours and the fuel was running low. I decided that was enough for today. At maximum speed, descending gently, we headed for home, crossing Texel Island. Styx was still seeing signals on the Serret device, and I hoped the rest of my guys were having success as well. Just in case any enemy night fighters tried to intercept us. I spiked over the North Sea to 600 meters while Styx continued to monitor his instrumentation. We proved that the Serrate instrument was operational, and we probably saved the lives of one or more of our bomber crews by destroying a Nazi airplane. We were both exhausted, especially Styx. He spent most of the flight staring intently at his CRTs. I knew from experience how difficult that was. 
At almost 3.30, we contacted the control room at Wittering and were soon on the ground surrounded by excited squadron mates. All but two of our aircraft had already returned, but the control room had contact with both of them. I breathed a sigh of relief. We hadn't lost anyone. I waited until the last two crews had landed. Then we all went to the mess hall to get some eggs and bacon and discuss the flight. Stix and I were the only successful crew, but several others had also come close and failed only because their radar or serrate device failed at a critical moment. However, the experience we had gained allowed us to be optimistic about the future. Although we did not know for sure whether our presence had caused confusion in the Luftwaffe's defences, we hoped that not only one downed aircraft, but our very presence in the stream may have prevented some enemy aircraft from attacking our bombers. The six weary crews reached their beds when it was already dawn. Later in the afternoon we learned that thirty of our bombers had not returned from the raid, but took comfort in the fact that there might have been more had it not been for the efforts of 141 Squadron. During June and July 1943, Bomber Command intensified its raids on the Ruhr and Hamburg. In these two vital industrial centres of Germany little was left but death and destruction. Germany's retaliation for its raids on the cities of occupied Europe and Britain was truly horrific. When the bombers flew, so did we, and regardless of the weather, and our successes slowly increased. Gradually, as our technical staff learned to repair defects in serrate instruments, we were able to increase the number of planes we sent. By the end of July, several crews of the squadron had shot down two or more enemy aircraft each. Sticks and I increased our personal score by damaging Deuces 88 during a raid by our bombers on Cologne. On another occasion, we destroyed a Mez Sirschmitt 110 near Elberfeld. So far, we have had no serious losses ourselves, although several of our planes were hit by anti-aircraft artillery or machine gun fire from our own bombers when flying close to them. During one of the raids on Cologne, my Bufighter was attacked twice during the night by Yuptus 88s and sustained damage. One engine caught fire. By steeply diving, we not only managed to evade the enemy fighter, but also knocked down the fire and successfully returned to wittering on one engine. During the small lulls, I would take one of the air station's liaison aircraft, usually a small tiger moth, to fly to Leicester. It was wonderful during these short visits to see Joan and the children and leave the strain of combat sorties behind for a few hours. But after spending the day with my family in Leicester, my heart was overwhelmed with guilt as I knew the other pilots of the squadron were fighting the enemy. My feelings must have burst through from time to time as I showed signs of irritation and sometimes outright anger towards my young sons. They, like all toddlers, were prone to crying and whining about anything, and I was not always able to understand their childish problems. This sometimes led to quarrels with my wife, and when I returned to the squadron I tried to forget my selfish behaviour by flying another combat mission or trying to drown my remorse with my friends in one of the local pubs. Shortly after our arrival at Witterig, we were joined by Paddy Inglebach. Paddy was a brilliant linguist, but not a very skilled pilot, although he had the heart of a lion. He was one of the few people I met who managed to bend the end tips of the metal propellers of a Bughaus Gira during takeoff. After three such incidents, consecutive within a short period of time during his training flights in the 141st, I decided that was more than enough. We could put up with damaging airplanes, but we couldn't have him killing himself. But when I informed him that I was removing him from flying, his extreme despondency and obvious desire to try to shoot down the enemy made me relent and allow him another chance. His piloting still left much to be desired, but he had flown many sorties over enemy territory. Inglebach didn't score any victories, but he managed not to bend any more propeller blades. The frequent long combat sorties were beginning to take their toll on some pilots. With the help of Dr. Gogol, I noticed those who were tired and gave them a short vacation. Unfortunately, I did not realise how exhausted Styx was until the night we had to abort the flight over Holland and return, because he was not feeling well. I deeply regretted my inattention, for Gregory was one of the most capable radio operators in England. In my greedy eagerness to get to the enemy I had unwittingly burned him, he was in desperate need of rest. At the end of July I told him I was going to keep him on the ground for a while, to give him a chance to regain his form. I asked if he would be willing to take up the position of operations officer in the squadron, responsible for planning sorties and briefings before them. There were tears in the eyes of poor, dedicated old sticks as he made his arguments against my offer. 
but in the end he realized that there was no point in continuing to fly without rest. Then he gave in and said it would be a good excuse to get Jacko out of Cranfield and give him the opportunity to fly combat sorties again, which he had been asking for a long time. I called the 12th Air Group headquarters people in charge of personnel and asked if they could help us get Jacko transferred to the 141st. A few days later, a very happy Jacko joined our squadron.